and five. Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The first annual Contracts for Difference auction uh, we've ever done completed last week and delivered a total of 3.7 gigawatts of renewable electricity, with contracts, I'm pleased to say, going to record numbers of projects. The auction delivered significant quantities of new solar, onshore wind generation, as well as supporting 11 new tidal stream projects and, for the first time, geothermal projects. It was a competitive auction set against a backdrop of highly challenging macroeconomic conditions, which have impacted the sector globally. It is our first annual round. It is to be expected that it would have a lower uh, capacity than the previous biannual rounds, or indeed, of course, on a three-yearly basis, because it was the first, last year's was the first one for three years, a higher uh, annual element than the, uh, the three years that we saw in last year's record round. The Government remains committed to offshore and floating offshore wind projects, and this round provides valuable uh, learning for subsequent auctions. Work has already started on allocation round six, incorporating the results of the recent round, and we look forward to a strong pipeline of technologies being able to participate. The move to annual auctions, of course, Mr Speaker, means that allocation round six will open in just six months' time in March 2024. This means there could be minimal or indeed no delay to deployment of new capacity through that round. The Government remains committed to its target of decarbonising the power system by 2035, to our ambitions for 50 gigawatts of offshore wind, including up to 5 gigawatts of floating offshore wind. Our trajectory for meeting these aims, as well as our legally binding Carbon Budget 6 targets, is not linear. The outcome for one technology in one auction does not prevent us from reaching those goals. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Ed Bilderman. Yeah. Mr Speaker, what a load of nonsense. No, no. No wonder the Secretary of State is in hiding. This auction is an energy security disaster for Britain, an act of economic self-harm by this government. No new offshore wind projects means energy bills for families will be higher by £2 billion and our energy security weakened. The worst thing of all, Mr Speaker, it was all totally avoidable. Ministers were warned again and again about the impacts of higher inflation. In a letter from Renewables UK in March, again in July, and, Mr Speaker, offshore wind is so much cheaper than gas that they could have raised the price in the auction and it would have still saved billions of pounds for families. But they refused to listen. So, first, will the Minister now tell us why did the Government ignore the repeated warnings? Second, uh, he said on Friday that every country was in the same boat, but that's just wrong. Ireland listened to industry, adjusted its price and had a successful auction in March 2023. Why did the Government not learn the lesson? Isn't the terrible truth that this episode reveals a much deeper flaw in the government's approach? For month after month this summer, they claim the answer to our energy crisis was more oil and gas. And this is the result. We will now be dependent on expensive, insecure fossil fuels, more exposed to the whims of petrostates and dictators. Every wind farm we fail to build makes us more exposed to dictators like Putin, and he knows it. Bills higher, security worse, jobs lost, climate failure. Mr Speaker, they've trashed offshore wind, the crown jewels of our energy system, raising bills, just like they trashed onshore wind by banning it, raising bills, just like they trashed home insulation, raising bills. Thirteen years of failed energy policy. All this fiasco shows is they are quite simply a party unfit to govern. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I hope, uh, and I was pleased to see the other day that the rumours of the right honourable gentleman no longer being in his position were, 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 were not true. And it's uh, understandable, perhaps, in that context that he's so passionate about this highly successful round that saw 3.7 gigawatts on an annualised basis, I think, uh, uh, a record uh, round. And, of course, uh, from a member of the previous Labour government, which left this country with 6.7% of its electricity coming from renewables. The first quarter of this year, Mr Speaker, our electricity was 48% from renewables. It was this government with its CFD system which transformed the economics of offshore wind. We have 77 gigawatts of offshore wind in the pipeline, more than enough. We have, we, we have 7.5. The right honourable gentleman, who, understandably given the weakness of his arguments, wants to heckle at all times, and knowing how easy it is to dismantle them, he asks me where, where, are, where is that capacity. 7.5 gigawatts is currently under construction. As ever, 
the right hon. Gentleman fails to be on the side of consumers. We, we moved to an annualised auction precisely in order to ensure that we could um, learn the lessons from each round, add it to our, our industry insight, and make sure that we could move forward. None of the projects which have been developed, they take multiple years to be developed, none of them have disappeared. And I predict, Mr Speaker, that moving on from the triumph of 3.7 gigawatts of renewables, com, uh, which came through successfully on Friday, AR6 will be more successful still, and we will continue to build our reputation as the country which has cut emissions more than any other major economy and taken has transformed not only our electricity generation but seeing the right honourable gentleman mentioned insulation how he has the goal I do not know we move from uh, 14% of homes 14 properly insulated when he left power it's over 50% by the end of this year Mr Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his engagement on this process, particularly with the new technology of floating offshore wind. And there were three floating offshore wind projects due to bid in AR5, and none did due to the low administrative strike price. As Chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group for the Celtic Sea, I have repeatedly been told that these projects are part of our future energy supply, and I wonder if the Minister could outline what steps he is taking to ensure these projects do float in AR6 and give confidence to developers in the region. Well, can I thank my honourable friend, who is an absolute uh, uh, champion of floating wind and the economic opportunities it offers for her area and the rest of the UK. I was delighted to speak to her last week, meet with her yesterday and uh, pay tribute to her efforts. We have the largest floating wind pipeline in the world based on uh, uh, confirmed seabed exclusivity arrangements. Uh, we have around 25 uh, gigawatts already identified, including through the Scott Wind leasing round and innovation and targeted oil and gas intog processes. And as she is a great champion and knows, the Crown Estate are moving forward with their leasing round five for up to four gigawatts of capacity in the Celtic Sea this year. We, are, we have been the world leader. We're going to stay as the world leader in floating. And thanks to the efforts of my honourable friend, I know that we will have the support of this House across the House. SMP spokesperson Dave Dugan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister failed to point out that 3.7 gigawatts is scarcely half what was achieved in auction round five. He also failed to mention, when he was heralding the onshore wind, that 98 per cent of that will be found in Scotland. Since 2014, the four auction rounds have yielded one, then 2.5, then five, then seven gigawatts. So a nil return is an utter catastrophe. The critical need for massive investment in offshore is patently obvious for bills and climate, yet this ambition has been thwarted by an incompetent, incompetent previous Secretary of State and a Treasury who know the price of everything and the value of nothing. So can the Minister assure us that <coughs> the Department will get round the table as a matter of urgency with industry to try and repair this damage? We need a strike price, and industry need a strike price that re reflects the mutually uh, not exclusive goals of lower bills, net zero, and jobs and investment in Scotland and elsewhere. So can he confirm if a recovery group for auction round five will be convened by the, him or the Secretary of State to try and get this catastrophe resolved. And where is she? Yeah. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the honourable gentleman and his party never fail to trash this country. And, uh, and of course, uh, he can heckle all he wishes. I'd like to say I, I will be uh, meeting uh, with industry representatives this afternoon. Uh, and uh, as, as I've said, we, 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 we will be announcing in two months' time. Uh, the uh, price ceiling for the next round, uh, and uh, uh, we, uh, uh, the, 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 to, to be getting the, the heckly, not least from His Majesty's opposition, who, as I say, left us in that absolute parlour situation. We are the world leader uh, in so many of these technologies, and we are going to continue to be. And if uh, the honourable gentleman was to uh, recognise the need to attract investment to this country, not talk this country down. He might find that Scottish jobs would be even stronger in pipeline than they are already. So Desmond Sway. If any, how much of the completed wind capacity still requires connection to the national grid? Uh, thank you. Well, un until... Uh, wind capacity is constructed, it isn't normally connected to the grid, so that which hasn't been connected to the grid will need to be connected to the grid. Chair of the Select Committee, Angus Brandon-McNeil. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. The boom and bust of this fiasco will have knock-ons uh, for supply chains inevitably. How concerned is he about that? And also, how concerned is he about projects that were built on CFD securities but have not been invoking the contracts and are now rake, literally raking in the windfall of that act? I didn't quite follow the second part of the uh, honourable uh, gentleman's question. Um, but uh, I'm, uh, I'm happy to uh, uh, write to him on that particular topic. Ian Littlegrange. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. West Somerset, obviously, as the Minister knows, is ideal for wind offshore. But I would be interested to know as to why people didn't bid in this round. Was there reasons and what those reasons were? And what the Government can do to make sure that the next round, people like my honourable friend from North Devon, can make sure that people are bidding, so we learn the lessons of this round. Well, I thank my honourable gen- uh, my honourable friend for his question. Uh, what we do is we set out uh, uh, typically in November the uh, auction parameters, key parameters, including the ceiling of what we will pay for particular technologies. We have to do, we do that based on our analysis of the supply chain costs. We commission external uh, uh, analysis as well, and the most important data of all comes from individual price parameters and because of a supply chain pinch and industry did warn and say as it does it has to be it has to be said every year that uh, uh, it wants us to pay more we always have to make a judgment call between making sure that we minimize i would it would be so much easier mr speaker to get an answer if he were to stop it can i can i just say as a man that was always happy to heckle from the bench i think he deserves a little bit himself come on minister Don't... <laughs> no, uh, uh, but, but to say, so we, we, we set those prices, we immediately learn from each auction, and one of the reasons for having annual auctions is we can quickly adjust, and as I say, projects can then come with little or, or minimal delay into the next round. Lloyd Russell Boyle. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah, the, the wind farm off Brighton has become iconic as probably the pier itself. But the reality is the government's failure will delay more of these beautiful installations around our coast. Is this failure not also a failure of a market-based private investment system that this government is determined to pursue rather than a publicly owned and coordinated building programme that can work alongside private investments so that we no longer have this failure where nobody bids? Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for revealing the true face of where uh, the Labour Party is going. They want to squeeze out, rather than the... T- we, we, we can go back to the days when we had hardly any renewables uh, and, when, and we can allow Great British Energy or whatever they're going to call their creature uh, to squeeze out private investment and destroy the most successful renewables market in Europe and destroy the progress which this government has made to take the parlous position left behind by the right honourable gentleman and his friends then, and we will continue to be the world leader in cutting emissions, but not if we move to the kind of uh, state-run uh, uh, left-wing obsession of colleagues like him. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Offshore wind has and will continue to play a key strate- strategic role in enhancing energy security, achieving net zero and in revitalising coastal communities such as Lowestoft. To get back on track, can my honourable friend confirm that the criteria applying to round six will take account of current economic realities, that appropriate fiscal measures are being considered ahead of the autumn statement, and that specific focus will be given to enhancing local supply chains. Can I thank my honourable friend, who has been such a consistent champion of the power of renewables, not only to meet our environmental challenges, but the economic benefits that come from it as well. And he's absolutely right. The whole nature of the CFD system is that it learns from the previous auction round, which is the most real data of all, and uses that to inform the next one. Um, and that's why I'm confident that just as uh, our 3.7 gigawatts on Friday was successful, AR6 promises to be more successful still. Yes. So, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and congratulations to the Minister for turning complacency and chutzpah into a new art form. I mean, the ineptitude, the ineptitude of Tory ministers means that this latest CFD round saw the smallest auction return since 2015, a failing that was entirely avoidable. So, how is he going to ensure that the UK delivers the 35 gigawatts of new offshore wind capacity which is needed in just six years? And why did ministers yet again fail to heed the warnings from industry and experts in advance? 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Lady for her question. Uh, we have to set the parameters based on the best information we have, and one of the reasons, as I say, for moving to an annual round is is precisely to allow us quickly to learn uh, from uh, the lessons of each round. We didn't get uh, wind in this, uh, on this occasion, which I regret, um, and we put in the real-world uh, prices and, and learnings from that into the next round. That's the system we have, because we're always trying to make sure that we get the parameters in the right way so it balances the need to generate uh, additional green energy with the cost to the taxpayer. And it's understandable, given their carelessness uh, with uh, public finances and indeed with consumers, that the opposition don't seem to care about that. My job is to balance ensuring we get the generation, and we have 77 gigawatts in the pipeline. We are in position and we are on track to meet our ambitions, which lead Europe. And not that you'd know that to listen to the Honourable Lady. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And, um, can I thank the Minister for including uh, geothermal projects in AR5? That's very welcome indeed. But can I echo the uh, words of my hon. Friend, the Member for North Devon, on everything she says about uh, the Celtic Sea projects? Um, can I ask him what we specifically are going to do differently in AR6? Um, can I ask him also what uh, advice he would give to the supply chain, specifically ports that are trying to apply, submit applications into the FLOMIS uh, funding, and also what conversations he's had regarding grid capacity to ensure that all of this eventually runs smoothly? Thank you. My hon. Friend, as ever, is, is very well informed. We're working on all those fronts. Flomis, of course, applications closed just two weeks ago, and we're working flat out to analyse those. And we, I hope by the end of the year we will have shortlisted to the sort of primary list those will move forward on due diligence as we take forward our uh, not only uh, floating wind deployment, but the supply chain uh, in the South West, in Wales, Scotland, and around the rest of the UK as well. So we're working on all those fronts and are determined to do that. And as, uh, I'm, I'm, as she rightly highlights, uh, seeing our first geothermal projects come through the CFD is fantastic, and uh, the 11 projects uh, for tidal. Um, and I pay tribute to all those colleagues who have worked so hard in promoting tidal energy uh, and making sure that we can continue to be a world leader there as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is an for the Government, and further shows that we are falling further and further behind in the race for green jobs internationally. We have got the lowest growth in these industries in the eight biggest economies. Should not the Government be focusing much more on broadening and increasing the capacity of offshore wind, rather than not listening to industry and making fatal errors? Yeah. Well, it, it's the party opposite's plan. If they're not, if they're not nationalising it or creating some state-owned uh, beer moth, uh, then they want to just hurl money in the direction of business. Our judgment is to balance those things, and I'm pleased to say that we've been successful. We have the largest offshore wind sector in Europe. This country and this government, through the CFD, transformed the economics from uh, the situation which we inherited when the right honourable gentleman and his colleagues were in power. Delivering on the floating offshore wind project in the Celtic Sea is vital for our energy security and decarbonisation. Does he agree with me that we do need now to bolster confidence in this emerging industry? And there's two things that he can do. Does he agree with me about a successful allocation of flowmas money to the South Wales ports to get this industry South moving West. is vital, and also ensuring that the Crown Estate's leasing round at the end of the year is done successfully, but with more than four gigawatts of visibility to really send a strong market signal to the industry to invest? Well, I can, can I uh, thank my right honourable friend for his question, and he too is, of course, someone who, through thick and thin, promotes this industry, sees the opportunity it, it offers Wales, um, and he, of course, makes a, uh, a special bid for the Welsh port, which I'd expect him to do, uh, but he would understand I can make no comment on that. Uh, I entirely agree with him uh, on the importance of the Crown Estate Round. Um, uh, suffice to say that across government we have been working flat out and with uh, his and other colleagues' support uh, to support the Crown Estate uh, to ensure that we maximise the opportunity in the Celtic Sea. Mr. Speaker, the government's obsession with oil and gas has left us in this mess. The department has prioritised new oil and gas licences over support for wind power, and this flies in the face of our climate change commitments and our responsibilities to our UK citizens, our constituents, to keep energy prices low. Oil and gas will always be more expensive than wind energy. When will the Minister fill the gap of five gigawatts of offshore wind that we have now missed on 
out on, which would have saved consumers £2 billion a year. And I'm not talking about the sixth auction round. I'm talking about the fifth auction round that we have missed out on now. I thank the Honourable Lady. Um, she's uh, completely mistaken. We are working flat out to both to reduce demand for fossil fuels within this country and to build up our renewables. And the fact that we have the largest offshore wind sector in Europe would be something I would hope she would celebrate. Speak Whitley. Mr Speaker, the government has long been warned that this focus on contracts for difference as a primary mechanism for financing new renewable risks undermine investor confidence in infrastructure assets with long lifespans but significantly upfront capital costs like nuclear and sidle range generation. Following the government's decision to employ a regulated asset-based model to support the development of new nuclear, will the Minister now commit to looking urgently at the optimum financial model for new tidal range projects which could have a crucial contribution to make to the UK future energy mix? Uh, Mr Speaker, the Contracts for Difference scheme is among the most successful uh, schemes of its sort in the world, if not the most successful. And no, we don't. Uh, we always look at ways that we can improve it, and one of those ways we're looking at is to uh, bring in non-price factors uh, within it as we finesse it. But I think uh, uh, the opposition party's idea of some uh, state-run enterprise squeezing out private investment would destroy. Um, uh, the opportunities going forward. We need at least another hundred billion invested by 2030, and the party opposite, if ever did threaten to come into power, would put all that at risk. Well, it's good again. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, on Tees side, we've been promised thousands of jobs in the offshore wind industry, but investors are getting a little nervous as a direct result of government failures to provide the right business environment. What is he going to do to get that business environment right to deliver the jobs we have been promised, but which have been put in jeopardy by government failures? I thank the honourable uh, gentleman. Uh, we are getting that balance right. We will continue to do so, and we will make sure I always have uh, the consumer uh, is my guiding light, making sure that we look after the consumer and we balance that with getting the generation we need. Uh, and we're seeing, we, we've seen companies like SIA investing uh, in Teesside. We've seen uh, companies like Sumotomo looking at investing into, uh, into Scotland. And, uh, and of course, uh, as the Honourable Gentleman uh, decries this and talks both the area and the nation down, of course, he then tells me that investors are getting nervous. If, if, he would, if he were to champion all the successes we've had instead of decrying them, he might find he would give investors even more confidence still. Sammy Wilson. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I don't agree with the policy which the Minister pursues, a disastrous policy which has been costly in terms of electricity prices and in future planning in terms of his net zero. But I do feel some sympathy for him today. He is being criticised by those who highlighted high energy prices for not offering inflated prices to the wind industry, which claims it is getting cheaper to produce wind. And yet, of course, they are wanting higher prices, and because they were not offered that, they would not bid in the auction. But is the real reason not that, for the first time, he has refused to allow those who bid to walk away from their contract for different agreements and price electricity at whatever price they want? and therefore have inflated uh, profits. And does that not indicate to him that the wind industry knows it can't produce electricity cheaply and wants the, the system uh, uh, a balance in favour of them? The Honourable Gentleman, for his question, I, I, you know, he and I do not see eye to eye, either on net zero or indeed the economic benefits of the wind industry. It does offer uh, cost effective. It has been amazing to see how, as it is scaled, it has been able to bring the price down. It was not obvious when you went out into the North Sea that you would be able to bring the price uh, crashing down, and yet this country led the world in doing so. And I would hope that the Honourable Gentleman, if he goes and looks at the numbers, he would find that the whole of this House could agree on one thing, which is offshore wind is an economic way of producing energy and one which all of us should support. Winter. Okay. Um, last week, the think tank Commonwealth made the critical point that, and I quote, reliance on market coordination leaves the transition vulnerable to the demands of private capital protecting their market. It is abundantly clear that private capital cannot deliver what is urgently required to stem the climate crisis. And in Wales, Welsh Government knows this, which is why over the summer it launched the community-owned renewable energy um, company, Annie Cymru. Does the Minister agree that this is what is required, and what actions is he taking to address this? 
Well, I thank the Honourable Lady again for pulling back the veil on Labour's real policy, which is it hates private capital, it hates private investment, and it would destroy the phenomenal success of this country in generating that. And the front bench can heckle all they like, but that's what the people behind the front bench want. That's the policy that threatens the British people and threatens our path to net zero. And we must make sure that people like the Honourable Lady never hold the, uh, never have power in this country. Scottish Renewables have said that the results are a major blow to the renewable sector in Scotland and should serve as an indication that urgent reform is needed. Scottish Renewables, not a political party but part of the industry, have also said that these disastrous results are bad for Scotland's energy supply chain, which desperately needs a steady stream of projects to make their own investments in skilling up and new technology. So will the Minister acknowledge that his failure and his department's failure to listen to warnings from the industry is holding back Scotland's renewable sector. Well, I thank the Honourable Lady. Um, industry always asks to be paid more money. Our job is to make the right judgment call on getting the balance right. Paul Williams. Uh, I saw in the newspapers yesterday that uh, astronomers have discovered a water-covered planet in a faraway galaxy. I have to disappoint these excited scientists. The Minister appears from his answers today so I've got there before them. Thank you. Um, seriously, though. <laughs> On another planet. Yeah. Uh, but seriously, the, this setback to the Erebus project in South West Wales is deeply disappointing. It was the first of its kind in Wales, and it was supposed to pave the way to a developing industry. I hope the Minister can reassure me that he is taking steps to make sure that in round six, projects like Erebus are enabled to... Uh, compete successfully and to lead the way for this industry in Wales. Well, I thank the honourable gentleman, not least for his attempt at a gag. Um, but, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, but I think, you know, I, I, I can tell him that what, that's the whole basis of the system, that it learns from each round and the most real economic data we get, we get at all uh, is from uh, an auction round. Moving to annual rounds, you are going to get ebb and flow as we seek to get that balance right between getting the generation we require against the extremely ambitious dead, uh, uh, deadlines we have and not paying too much for it. That's the balance we strike. We've got 3.7 gigawatts. I imagine we'll do even better next time. Carl Michael. Now, I feel I'm almost taking my life in my hands, but I do want to commend the Minister for one small piece of good news in this round, and that is in relation to the development of marine renewables. The success of the auction for tidal stream development illustrates, I think, what would be possible for wave power if they were to be given the same opportunity in AR6. But for tidal stream, does the Minister agree with me that what is now needed is the one gigawatt target for deployment, and will he work with me, other people uh, with an interest in the House and the, the marine renewable uh, sector themselves to deliver that ahead of AR6? Yeah. Well, may I pay tribute to the right honourable gentleman? I met with him in his constituency when I visited EMEC. Um, I saw for myself uh, some of the projects in the water, and I'm personally determined to ensure that tidal stream continues to grow. We may maintain our global leadership with a very high percentage UK supply chain as, as a further uh, a positive to it. Um, uh, he tempts me to uh, get ahead of myself on policy. I can't do that. But what we are doing and what our dedicated pot this year did is further strengthen that so that we can get in a position where that might be a realistic policy um, position to take. Thank you very much, Mr. Well, even with a higher price, offshore wind would help to slash bills. So when the Minister saw the Irish Government recognise inflation, up the price and proceed to a successful auction, what discussions did he have with the industry and with Treasury colleagues about the price to be set? Mm. Good well, I thank the Honourable Lady for her question, which is a good one. And obviously we did look at whether uh, intervention, uh, given that prices continue to change after we said it was the right thing to do. Uh, we don't think, we think the CFD mechanism, the way that it's operated is sound and that the uh, best thing to do was to allow that to pass for the year and the, one of the reasons for having the annual the annual uh, uh, the, one of the reasons for ha having the annual auction was precisely to allow you quickly to adjust and as I say as soon as November we'll be setting the parameters for the next Richard Ford Mr Speaker last November the government paid up to 700 million pounds to China General Nuclear to buy out China's state-owned nuclear power enterprise from Sizewell C. And we spent the best part of 2022 
freeing ourselves from our reliance on Russian oil and gas. Given the failure of this government to sell offshore wind projects in the latest round, can the Minister please comment on how energy independence from authoritarian states was served by this inability to run an auction? Well, I thank the Honourable Gentleman. We are now running these auctions every year, and every year we will be seeking to get the generation we require at the lowest possible cost to consumer. I make no apology for doing that, and the fact that we have the most successful system, not only, not only in Europe, but actually globally, for doing it is something which should be applauded and recognised. Jonathan Edwards. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Windsor uh, report last month provides a sobering analysis about the scale of new electricity transmission infrastructure required to serve increased renewable generation and consumer demand in a very short space of time. But as the report finds, there is considerable resistance locally to pylon development. As we are finding out in my constituency, uh, competence for that, uh, for that development is a matter for the Welsh Government. However, will the Minister pull together a working group of ministers from across the UK and experts to consider the Windsor report and in particular to consider the ad advantages of cable ploughing technology which would underground uh, these cables at a comparable cost to overhead pylons without the visual damage. Can I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his uh, constructive and, uh, and uh, uh, effective question. He is absolutely right to highlight the challenges of, of making sure that we have the right transmission and connection infrastructure to facilitate offshore wind, that we have got to do it in a way which minimises negative impacts on communities, that rewards them for hosting it, uh, and looks at new technologies and innovation, just as we do in other areas, in order to facilitate uh, that uh, uh, you know, effective uh, connection with minimal negative impacts on communities who host. Jim Shannon. Mr Speaker, and, uh, in, light, Minister, in light of the disappointing results of the contract for Difference A or 5 auction, and always trying to be constructive in, in my contributions in, in this House, will Government revisit the exclusion of Northern Ireland renewable projects from the scheme, especially in light of the significant increase in onshore wind and tidal stream projects supported by the AR5. Northern Ireland Mr. Speaker, is perfectly positioned for onshore wind and tidal stream to make a major contribution to energy security and net zero from AR6 and beyond. Will the Minister commit to enable Northern Ireland to be part of AR6? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I suggest it is the Honourable Gentleman and his colleagues who need to commit uh, to facilitating that in Northern Ireland. Energy is devolved, and it is up to them to get the devolved assembly up and running, get devolved government going in Northern Ireland, and unleash these opportunities. It is not uh, for this department, which is not responsible for energy in Northern Ireland. I think that completes the urgent question. <laughs> point of order, Murray Kelly Ford, now. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On a, a point of order, St. Leonard's in my constituency is one of the schools affected by RAC. Last week, we received a ministerial statement from the Secretary of State for Education. But this week, despite RAC still being an issue, we have heard nothing from the Secretary of State or a minister. The issue may be yesterday's news to some, but it is a very real issue for my constituents, many of whom have written to me to express their anger and anxiety about this avoidable crisis. Therefore, may I please seek your guidance as to how we can implore the Secretary of State to come back to the House uh, this week, preferably tomorrow when it is well attended, and update us on what her department is doing. Thank you. Can I first of all say thank you to our Member, I am grateful on the notice of the point of order. As she says, the Education Secretary did make a statement on this subject last week. I have had no notice from ministers that they intend to make a further statement on this matter this week. However, I am sure that ministers on the Treasury bench will have heard the Honourable Member's point of order, and I know that the House would prefer an update before the House does go up again. Daisy Cooper, point of order. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On a point of order, I should say this point of order does come with a trigger warning. Uh, today, BBC News, The Times newspaper and others are carrying shocking reports that female surgeons are being sexually harassed, assaulted and, in some cases, raped by colleagues, and that some of the sexual assaults are taking place in operating theatres whilst female surgeons are performing surgery on anaesthetised patients. This House will also be aware that on the 23rd of May this year, it was reported that more than 35,000 incidents of sexual misconduct or sexual violence were recorded on NHS premises in England between 2017 and 2022. 
Mr Speaker, these reports are just as serious as some of the revelations about sexual misconduct within the Met Police that rightly led to the creation of the Casey Review into the standards of behaviour and internal culture of the Met. But when, revel when revelations are repeatedly made about the scale of the same problem within the NHS, they are met with government inaction. Mr Speaker, I would be grateful if you were able to confirm either way whether or not the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care intends to make a statement to this House on today's shocking revelations, or indeed whether they will be intend to announce an independent inquiry so we can expose the scale of sexual misconduct in the NHS and put an end to this horrific practice and culture of silence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Can I first of all say thank you to the member for giving me notice of the point of order. I have had no indication from ministers that they intend to make a statement on this important matter, but I am sure that the government's front bench will have heard her point of order, and if not, I am sure she will pursue it through other ways. And I know that there is opportunities to do so before the House rises. Okay. No further points of order. We now come to the 10-minute rule bill. I call Sam Terry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that leave be given to bring a bill to require Ofgem to amend the conditions of an electricity supply licence concerning vulnerable customers, to require Ofgem to establish a fund for the purpose of rectifying dangerous electrical faults for vulnerable customers, to require energy supply companies to inform vulnerable customers about the services available to customers on the priority services register and for connected purposes. Mr Deputy Speaker, I rise today to propose a bill that seeks to address a critical issue in our energy sector. This bill aims to require Ofgem to revise the terms of electricity supply licences with a much-needed focus on vulnerable customers. Specifically, it calls for the creation of a fund by Ofgem to rectify dangerous electrical faults affecting vulnerable customers. Additionally, it mandates energy supply companies to inform vulnerable customers about their entitlements under the Priority Services Register and related matters. As the UK moves towards achieving net zero emissions, our homes are undergoing a transformation in how they use energy. We are transitioning away from gas and increasingly adopting cleaner energy systems. Currently, 74% of homes rely on gas boilers for heating. But by 2035, up to 47% of homes could depend on electrically powered technologies like heat pumps. This shift towards electricity is expected to continue in the years ahead. In this transition, it is imperative that we prioritise the safety and well-being of our vulnerable citizens. Last year, in England alone, there were staggering 2,695 fires caused by home electrical installations. That's averaging seven fires a day. These incidents encompass issues relating to electrical distribution within homes and heating systems. Now, despite support from organisations such as Electrical Safety First, the Gas Safe Charity, Chartered Institute of Housing, the National Home Improvement Council and the National Energy Action, as well as the Priority Services Register, maintained by energy suppliers, it has fallen short in addressing critical safety concerns for the most vulnerable in society. The PSR administered by Ofgem, serves as a support system for vulnerable energy customers offered voluntarily by suppliers. It provides assistance tailored to specific requirements. While the types of help can vary amongst suppliers, they typically do include free gas safety checks for customers on a means-tested benefits living with children under five years old, as those receiving pensions and individuals living alone with others who are disabled or chronically ill and those who are disabled or chronically ill. This invaluable service has undoubtedly saved lives, and this bill seeks to extend similar safeguards to the many households across the country using and depending on electricity. Now, whilst existing legislation in England, Scotland and Wales mandates electrical safety checks of vulnerable individuals living in private rented sector, the recent Social Housing Regulations Act of 2023 has extended those checks to those in the social rented sector, aligning England with Wales and Scotland. However, a significant portion of vulnerable people may still fall through the cracks. Data from various housing surveys across the UK indicates that in 2021, as many as 10.8 million households could qualify for the PSR services register, marking them out as part of a vulnerable household. Furthermore, the elderly population, 
often eligible for PSR, predominantly resides in, owner, in the only occupied sector, which lacks mandatory requirements for essential electrical safety protections. So the risk of electrical fire fatalities is notably higher for people aged 60 and above, particularly those living alone or in older housing with outdated electrics. This is significantly heightened if they have health conditions like dementia or Parkinson's. Indeed, vulnerable people are more susceptible to electrical fires when they lack the financial means to pay for electrical safety checks or are physically unable to respond swiftly in the case of a fire. Many of them may reside in substandard housing with outdated electrical systems, potentially in higher density housing, further increasing the risk of fire spreading to neighbouring properties. Mr Deputy Speaker, this bill also addresses the pressing issue of fuel poverty among PSR registered people. There is a significant overlap between vulnerable individuals on the PSR and those experiencing fuel poverty. The rising cost of living has hit many households hard, but is incredibly challenging for older and vulnerable groups, particularly regarding energy costs. As of 2022, England alone had 3.26 million households in fuel poverty. In my constituency of Ilford South, that's 15 per cent of households, over 6,000 families daily grappling with fuel poverty. Shockingly cold homes linked to fuel poverty contributed to 4,020 excess winter deaths in England and Wales last year. That's resulting in 45 loss each single day during the winter months. For vulnerable people who already face the difficult choice between heating their homes and having enough to eat, affording electrical system checks is often impossible. This hidden danger compounds the already distressing issue of fuel poverty. While the PSR is voluntary, for energy providers, it includes a requirement for free gas and carbon dioxide checks under Ofgem's licensing conditions. Nonetheless, concerns have been raised by organisations like the National Energy Action Group regarding the alarmingly low awareness of available assistance. It is therefore crucial for energy suppliers not only to promote their services, but also to actively involve all eligible people onto the PSR, expanding the reach of these services across the board. In fact, in November 2022, a study of eligible PSR customers, Electrical Safety First, found that a quarter of respondents had never checked their electrical installations or were unsure if they had ever been checked. 85% of them supported the idea of the energy sector providing regular electrical checks as a requirement of the PSR, a viewpoint shared by both private and social housing landlords. Of course, some of these checks may reveal severe and dangerous faults in electrical systems. This bill will address that concern. It requires energy companies, Ofgem and local authorities to have the necessary grant-making capabilities to address these issues. This ensures that vulnerable people with electrical faults are afforded the same protections as those with gas safety issues. In conclusion, Mr Deputy Speaker, we have a moral obligation to shield the most vulnerable members of our society from the devastating consequences of fuel poverty and electrical dangers. Today, as this bill receives its first reading, we take the first crucial step towards achieving this goal. It will guarantee, as a statutory minimum, that those susceptible to fuel poverty during this era of rising living costs receive enhanced electrical safety protections. We cannot permit millions of people to make the heart-wrenching choice between food, safety and living in peril. So I urge today this House to support my bill. The question is that the Honourable Gentleman have leave to bring in his bill. As many of that opinion say aye. Aye. Country no. The ayes have it. Who will prepare and bring in the bill? Mr Mike Amesbury, Mr Andrew Weston, Ms Olivia Blake, Mr Lloyd Russell Moyle, Mr Carl Turner, Mr Jim Shannon, Ms Sarah Olney, Mr Chris Loder, Mr Derek Thomas, Mr Peter Bottomley, Ms Allison. Thewlis. Sam Tarry. Electricity Supply Vulnerable Customers Bill. Second reading, what day? 24th of November. 24th of November. <laughs> Call.
colleagues, imminently, we will come to the motion on the retirement of the Clerk of the House. And I will look to the Leader of the House to move the motion on congratulations to Sir John Benger. Just before I do, I should like to place on record a letter from the outgoing Clerk of the House, Sir John Benger. Sir John Wright, you notified the House last February of my intention to retire as Clerk of the House to take up a new role next month as Master of St Catherine's College, Cambridge. I wanted to thank you, Mr Speaker, for your unfailing support, both to me personally and to the House of Commons administration. You care deeply about the institution of Parliament, but also about all the staff who work here. I want to record your personal contribution to improving the welfare of spaces for many of our staff on rotors, working on social hours in often difficult conditions. I also want to thank you for placing so high a priority on security for all who work in Parliament. You sat in chamber during those difficult hours following the murder of PC Keith Palmer, an event which I know which affected you deeply. May I also thank the deputy speakers who have been a pleasure to work with. The murders of two honourable members, Sir David Amis and Joe Cox, caused us all the great sadness. I knew Sir David personally. He served on the Health Committee for all of the six years I clerked it, always enthusiastic, never failing to see the absurdity in life. But like Joe Cox, a tireless champion of his constituents and of the causes he believed in. Nowadays, every member has to deal with more than their first share of abuse and hostility. But I have to say, I found almost all the members to be passionately committed to changing the world for the better and serving their constituents. I will always remember and appreciate commitment by members to public service. I took up my current role in 2019. My main objective was to help implement the recommendations made by Dame Laura Cox in her report following the dreadful accounts of bullying and harassment in Parliament. All Dame Laura's key recommendations have been implemented and we should celebrate the fact that our Parliament now leads the world in having an independent process to examine such matters. There is more to be done, as we all know, and too much unacceptable behaviour still occurs. But I salute those members and staff who had the courage to help introduce ICGS. My first few months were occupied with the fraught challenges of Brexit. In context of a minority government, and many of us will remember what a difficult parliament that was. But of course, even greater challenges lay around the corner. With the advent of COVID-19, prompting dramatic changes to how we operate. I am so proud of my colleagues for helping this Parliament to lead the world in sitting in hybrid form, transforming procedures, adopting our physical spaces, rapidly introducing necessary technology. To achieve this in a matter of days, a truly astonishing achievement. Here in Parliament, we have some of the finest public servants dedicated, professionalism and at their best when there is such a challenge. But it is their friendship and support, as much as their professionalism, that I will remember, and for which I will always be grateful. Yours sincerely, John. I would now like to take this opportunity to say a few words of my own about Sir John. You may not realise this, but John is in fact a northerner, having grown up in Stockport. And if you want proof of those northern roots, I suggest you say something derogatory about Manchester United, where his continued commitment to the north will become very clear. 
In fact, he's led a little bit in the shadows with Manchester City of late, and he does struggle to stomach that. He left the North, however, to join the House in 1986, having on the way read English literature at St Catherine's College. Trained as a teacher, then completed his doctorate in philosophy in English at Oxford University. His first role in the then clerk's department was a second clerk on what was the Trade and Industry Committee. It was there when he first met the Member of Parliament for Warrington North, one Doug Hoyle. It was not to be the last Hoyle he would work with, and indeed I have counted myself. What a privilege to have worked alongside John since he was appointed of the 51st Clerk of the House, as Speaker and before at Chairman of Ways and Means. John has been Clerk through what, by anyone's estimation, has been a challenging period. He provided leadership during the pandemic with some diligence and focus that he applies to everything he turns his hand to, tempered as always with his signature and good humour. He's also been at the helm during many occasions when this House has been at the centre of national and international attention, following the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II just a year ago. It is a credit to his leadership and, of course, to all those who work here and support the House, that through all those turbulent times, the House of Commons has shown itself in its very best light. John should be very proud of the progress he's made in improving the culture, the environment in which we all work, following the findings of Laura Cox in 2018 of bullying and harassment. He's been a personal champion of work on inclusion, diversity in the House of Commons, and a mentor for colleagues in the House of Parliament. I know I speak for all of those who work here when I thank him for his dedication to those important, important parts of his work. I will always be grateful for John for his support and sound guidance he has provided to me over the last four years as clerk. And of course, I will say John is a friend as well as being clerk of the House. And to know John takes a little bit of understanding because he's always dedicated to the House and he'll always put the House first. But he's more dedication to Erskine May, Erskine and May, both John's two cats, who are of great age of over 18 years. And they will not stop him from leaving to make sure they're fed and well looked after. And John's other specialty is chicken. If you ever ask him, I've got to get home, I must put the chicken in, I'm never quite sure whether it's for the family or whether it's for a skin and me. I know the House will join me today in thanking Sir John for contributing nearly four decades of exemplary public service. I wish him all the very best in his new role as Master of St Catherine's College, Cambridge. And to say, what is their gain is our loss, but we do wish him well. And I know the House will continue, as he would expect. I would now like to call the Leader to move the motion. Thank you.